former music producer for Sean Diddy Combs, worked on his latest album with him, suing him for sex trafficking and sexual assault and harassment. Well, they filed new court documents. And included in those documents was an unsworn declaration from Jones himself, detailing more things he saw, heard, experienced during his time working and basically living with Combs. And in this 18-page declaration, it starts with a promise that he's telling the truth. Quote, I have personal knowledge of the facts set forth herein, which I know to be true and correct. And if called upon to testify as a witness, I could and would completely testify there too. Now, he's declaring all of this under threat of perjury. So if he's lying, that's a big deal. Now, if you ask me, I think one of the reasons Jones is doing this is to bolster his credibility because it's come under attack in the public. As we mentioned, some of the people that he mentioned in his lawsuit have fired back against those allegations. Opposing counsel questioned his narratives and motives. So this is an opportunity for him to tell the court, look, I have the receipts. I can back up what I'm saying. I will testify about this. So there are a lot of details that he provides, including background and how he got linked up with and started working for Diddy. And we already covered a lot of that in his complaint on previous sidebars. But according to Jones, he has hundreds of hours of video of Combs in his inner circle. He says that Combs required him to film constantly because he did not like to repeat himself. He said, quote, I quickly learned that from observing him lose his temper with his staff and family if they failed to remember something he said a day or two prior. Jones lists out crimes that he says he saw happen in real time. Quote, I witnessed the acquisition, use, and distribution of ecstasy, cocaine, GHB, ketamine, marijuana, and mushrooms. I witnessed Mr. Combs display and distribute unregistered illegal firearms. I witnessed Mr. Combs provide laced alcoholic beverages to minors and sex workers at his homes in California, New York, the Virgin Islands, and Florida. I witnessed Mr. Combs' chief of staff, Christina Corum, instruct the staff to retrieve drugs so she could provide them to Mr. Combs for his consumption. And then Jones also talks about that alleged assault that he witnessed on Combs' chartered yacht. You remember when we covered this, that Jones's attorneys had filed a separate civil action against Combs' son, Christian King Combs, on behalf of a woman named Grace O'Markey. She was a steward on the yacht. Remember, and Combs had chartered that yacht for the Christmas holiday in 2022. So according to the declaration, Jones, quote, witnessed Christian Combs drug and sexually assault a stewardess while we were on the yacht Mr. Combs rented in St. Barthelemy, St. Martin, and the Virgin Islands. The assault began in the makeshift studio on the yacht while I was recording Christian Combs' auto-tunes rapping. Again, we talked more in depth about that lawsuit in another sidebar episode. Amarki claims that Christian gave her a spike, a spike drink, touched her all over her body without her permission, and tried to force her to perform oral sex on him, and she had to actually fight him off. Now, the next part of this declaration from Mr. Jones is absolutely fascinating. It reads, quote, I have videos of Mr. Combs and me working out on the treadmill with T.D. Jakes playing on the monitor. We watch T.D. Jakes' sermons every morning during our workouts. At first, I thought it was admirable that Mr. Combs listened to sermons while working out until I realized he was not studying the message, he was studying the messenger's mannerisms. During our gym sessions, he detailed how he planned to leverage his relationship with Bishop T.D. Jakes to soften the impact on his public image of Cassie Ventura's pending lawsuit. Remember, Ventura had filed a lawsuit against Combs back in 2023 for sexual assault and sex trafficking, but she ended up settling with Combs the day after it was filed. So Jones also goes into detail about what he said happened at this so-called writer's camp at Chalice Recording Studios. You may recall that in his lawsuit, he claims he witnessed a shooting there and that Combs allegedly tried to cover up his involvement. He writes, quote, Mr. Combs converted the parking lot of Chalice Recording Studios into a makeshift nightclub. He had everything imaginable there, including a full-service bar, a massage spa, and hookah. Mr. Combs required everyone working on the Love album to take laced shots of De Leon tequila. There was no way to tell him no. Mr. Combs felt anyone who refused to drink with him was suspicious and untrustworthy. At the time, I did not realize that he used the laced shots of alcohol to obtain and maintain control over the person consuming the alcohol. And of course, the lawsuits against Combs have accused him of sex trafficking, and that is allegedly what the Homeland Security investigation into him is tied to, a trafficking operation. Remember, his uh, properties in L.A. and Miami were raided by Homeland Security agents two weeks ago. 
Jones continues in the declaration with, quote, Throughout the duration of my time living with Mr. Combs, I personally witnessed Mr. Combs order his staff to bring him drugs and sex workers. This was a common occurrence, and he was never told no. During this time, I was forced to solicit sex workers and perform sex acts to the pleasure of Mr. Combs. Unbeknownst to me, Mr. Combs had hidden cameras and audio devices in all of the rooms of his homes. I only discovered this several months into living with him when I had to pick up my Uber Eats delivery from the security office. Usually, the security would bring my food deliveries to me whenever I was in Mr. Combs' home, but at this point, I was close and familiar with the security, so they called me to their room and told me I could go in and retrieve my food myself. I saw four to six large flat-screen television monitors at the time. Each monitor had at least 20 to 30 little screens in them. Each screen was a view of a room in and surrounding Mr. Combs' home. Remember, Jones claims that he was sex trafficked, and if there is videos of this and that's presented at a trial, that is significant evidence, to say the least. Now, Jones even listed out the document dates when he says he was forced to solicit sex workers for Combs. He also names a celebrity that we haven't really referenced yet. Chris Brown. Yeah, quote, on July 2nd, 2023, Mr. Combs had a listening party in his California home. There were a lot of people present at this party, including Chris Brown, Justin Combs, sex workers, and some underage girls. Justin Combs would typically bring the younger women to these parties. I have two videos of two different sex workers that Justin Combs brought with him to Chalice Recording Studios. I can provide the videos to the court. This event began at 7 p.m. Mr. Combs requested female sex workers and required me to solicit them. An hour later, several sex workers appeared. In addition to sex workers, there were at least five women in the crowd who appeared to be under the age of 16. Mr. Combs forced all the attendees to drink laced De Leon liquor. I believe Mr. Combs laced the liquor with ecstasy. I have personally witnessed his staff members, Brendan Paul and Moy Bon lace alcohol with ecstasy. And we remember Brendan Paul was actually arrested on drug charges during the raid on Diddy's properties. But Jones continues, quote, the presence of what I perceived to be underage women made me very uncomfortable. I attempted to leave and Mr. Combs forced me to stay. I had my car keys in my book bag. I have never lost my keys and Mr. Combs went so far as to take my car keys to prevent me from leaving. After being forced to drink laced De Leon shots, I began feeling lightheaded and I passed out. I remember waking up at 4 a.m. the following morning naked with a sex worker sleeping next to me. In his complaint, Jones had previously mentioned a similar event and describes it in this declaration as well, writing, quote, On February 2nd, 2023, I believe Mr. Combs drugged me. I remember waking up naked, dizzy, and confused. I was in bed with two sex workers and Mr. Combs. I also recall aimlessly wandering around the house with no clothes on. I have photos of the sex workers sleeping on the bed the morning after. I can provide it to the court if necessary. And from there, Jones explains in this declaration some of the things he says that Combs offered him, which is important in a sex trafficking case, that you were transported over state lines, forced to perform sex acts, and were promised something of value. That's the commercial element of commercial sex acts. Quote, Mr. Combs promised me many things to entice me to continue engaging in his sex trafficking operation. On multiple occasions, we discussed winning Grammys for the Love Album. He promised I would win the Grammy for Producer of the Year for the Love Album. He offered me $250,000 to purchase all the instruments I wanted. He promised me ownership of his $20 million property, One Star Island in Miami, Florida. He promised to give me access to record label executives. And from there, Jones gives more details about an alleged assault that happened in Miami. He says that while using the restroom, young Miami's cousin burst into the bathroom and began groping him. Quote, I honestly believe that Mr. Combs sent her in there to sexually assault me as I could hear him and the other guests laughing outside the door. As she entered the bathroom, she dropped to her knees and began performing oral sex on my exposed penis. I pushed her away and exited the bathroom. Young Miami's cousin did not accept my rejection and followed me out of the bathroom. She started undressing in front of everyone and attempted to straddle me and have sex with me in the presence of Mr. Combs and his staff. They were all laughing. Jones also talked about Combs' sometimes violent personality. Quote, Mr. Combs often switched his approach to force me to obey and comply with his demands. On multiple occasions, he would threaten me with physical harm. Mr. Combs threatened to eat my face and informed me that he was willing to kill his mother to get what he wanted so he wouldn't think twice about 
harming me. That is something that we heard in the prior complaint as well. Quote, Mr. Combs would also make me work out of this bedroom whenever he had gang members and drug dealers visit him. I have witnessed Mr. Combs hand out guns from the hidden room in his bedroom closet. I have witnessed known gang members at his home in L.A. and Miami be paid from the stacks of cash he has in the hidden room in his bedroom closet. Jones says that Combs was very aware of the power he had and made sure that everyone around him knew it too. Quote, Throughout my time living with Mr. Combs, he made it very clear that he did not spend his money on anything. He made it clear that he had partnerships and relationships with very powerful individuals and organizations, and these individuals and organizations funded his lifestyle. And then the declaration from Jones also rebuts claims by Universal Music Group, a defendant in his lawsuit. Jones writes, quote, My counsel informed me that UMG claims that they did not pay for sex workers or sponsored any of the club love parties or the writer's camp. These claims are contradicted by the reality I saw with my own eyes. There were employees of UMG and Motown present at the writer's camp, at listening parties and after parties. I was told by Mr. Combs they were there and I saw them there. Mr. Combs told me they were scouting for talent. As it pertains to the sex workers, they also paid for them. I have several videos of the Chalice recording studio sessions as well as in-home recording sessions and there are sex workers and producers in the studio. The sex workers in these videos were the only individuals paid. So again, this is his account, right? If he backs it up by receipts, photos, screenshots, it's important. It's important. And these are very, very serious claims. But And now he's doubling down on this court filing saying that in this unsworn declaration that he can prove it. Now, I will tell you that Jones, he also provides multiple photos in the lawsuit of men and women inside a recording studio. Jones claims that the women in these photos are sex workers. And the declaration goes on to talk about the bragging that Combs allegedly did to Jones, that he lists out several stories Combs allegedly told him. Quote, Mr. Combs bragged about having Daphne Joy, the child mother of a competing rapper, on payroll as one of his sex workers. I have a video of Mr. Combs on a massage table receiving a massage from a professional masseuse while Daphne Joy is giving him a foot massage. Mr. Combs bragged about shooting a woman in the face in 1999 in New York City and getting away with it. He bragged about departed attorney Johnny Cochran's savvy legal skills and ability to pay off the witnesses through private investigators and other third parties. He bragged about having Jennifer Lopez carrying his gun into the club the night of the shooting and the fact that he had so much power and influence over her at the time. He bragged about getting Shine to take the heat for the shooting and the fact that he paid Shine through a record deal with his good friend L.A. Reid. And it doesn't end there because he also says that, quote, Mr. Combs also informed me that only poor people pay taxes. He shared that it is a common practice in the music industry to wire money from anonymous accounts overseas. This way, if there is ever a need to take care of a problem, it would never be traced back to him. These accounts were in Germany. At the very end of the document, Jones says, quote, I could share other things, but I do not feel comfortable putting them in this document. I I will be willing to discuss them with the court under seal to preserve my Fifth Amendment rights. Now, a lot to take in there. This just doubles down my belief that he is a cooperating witness with the government in this potential criminal investigation. I have to believe it. And if he is one of the witnesses that's cooperating and federal authorities raided these properties, they have to be taking what he's saying is true. And maybe they're corroborating what he is saying through evidence that was seized from uh, Combs properties. Okay, so a lot to take in. but. We also want to tell you quickly about a new letter that Jones' attorney filed with the court after accusations that this attorney was being too salacious with his court filings. I'm talking about Tyrone Blackburn. He's one of the lawyers representing Rodney Jones and Grace O'Markey in their lawsuits against Sean Combs, Christian Combs, and others. United States District Court Judge for the Southern District of New York, Denise Cote, submitted a referral to the New York Federal Court Grievance Committee claiming that Issues with Blackburn in five cases, she wrote, quote, significant resources have been spent by judges of the court and defendants named in actions he has filed to address glaring deficiencies in his filings. A referral to this court's grievance committee is warranted. She goes on to write, a reasonable inference from Blackburn's pattern of behavior is that he improperly files cases in federal court to garner media attention, embarrass defendants with salacious allegations, and pressure defendants to settle quickly. Indeed, his submissions to this court have been rife with disturbing allegations against the defendants and defense counsel. 
Now, other lawyers have also criticized Mr. Blackburn as well. Combs attorney Sean Holly alleged that Blackburn ignored exonerating evidence, writing, quote, our attempts to share this proof with Mr. Jones' attorney, Tyrone Blackburn, have been ignored as Mr. Blackburn refuses to return our calls. We will address these outlandish allegations in court and take all appropriate action against those who make them. Then, attorneys for UMG, Universal Music Group, one of the defendants who are also being sued by Rodney Jones for their alleged participation and facilitation of the abuse and trafficking claimed by Jones, they argued, UMG, that the claims presented by Jones were, quote, so offensively false. One of those lawyers, Donald Sakarin, said, quote, A license to practice law is a privilege. Mr. Blackburn, plaintiff's lawyer, has misused that license to self-promote, gratuitously, falsely, and recklessly accusing the UMG defendants of criminal behavior. Well, Mr. Blackburn is firing back. He is not taking that lying down. No, he wrote a letter to Judge J. Paul Oatkin, a judge for the Southern District of New York, where Jones' lawsuit against Combs is currently filed. And he begins by saying, quote, at the onset, I apologize for wasting the court's time by having to read a letter that has nothing to do with the matters before your honor. He goes on to say that the defendants have, quote, decided to scrummage through PACER. That, by the way, is the online court record. In search of anything to distract and deflect from the blatantly obvious fact that they cannot defend their actions as it relates to their business partnership with Sean Combs. He continued, quote, I do not improperly file cases in federal court to garner media attention, embarrass defendants with salacious allegations, and pressure defendants to settle quickly. I gain no benefit from filing cases in federal court over state court, and I am not an ambulance chasing attorney who lives in front of a camera. Before filing any case, I always provide an opportunity for private resolution. If this case cannot be resolved privately, then I file. I do not pursue media attention. With this case alone, I have been inundated with invitations to appear on television shows, podcasts, and radio shows, both nationally and internationally, and I have rejected them all. Then he says this, bold and underlined, quote, Although I pick my clients, I do not pick their facts. If a client comes to me with a complaint of sexual assault, and she or he has evidence to support their claims, it is my duty to include all materials relied upon in drafting the complaint into the pleading. And then he cites some case law to support that. But remember, one of the things that we called out in the complaint is how there were these screenshots of videos, photos, copies of text, receipts for trips, and so forth. Blackburn goes on to end the letter with, quote, Finally, a referral is not a sanction. My pleadings in this district have consistently comported with the standard established pursuant to Rule 8 of the FRCP and the standard established by the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. If defendants are concerned about having a salacious claim filed against them, they should not engage in salacious acts. It was the defendant's choice to enter a general business partnership with Sean Combs, which funded his sex trafficking operation. Now, while neither Combs nor his sons have been arrested or criminally charged with respect to this investigation, many analysts that we have spoken to believe it is only a matter of time before that happens. Okay, we have this lawsuit from Grace or Markey. And before we even get into the details of it, there is a question now of what is happening with this. Why do I say that? Because the filing was not on the court system's docket. According to the Washington Post, O'Markey's attorney, Tyrone Blackburn, said that it had to be taken down after an unfiled version of the complaint was published by the media. So I don't know what to take away from that, if that means that what we reviewed last week wasn't supposed to be seen. Not sure. But assuming this lawsuit does move forward, there is a lot to break down in it. Okay, first off, I have to say, now that I have the paperwork in my hand and I have the complaint in my hand, one of the things that struck me right from the beginning is how personal this is. Quote, Defendant C. Combs, that's Christian Combs, is a 25-year-old auto-tuned and heavily edited rapper. Wow. Wow. Unfortunately, as the saying has it, the apple does not fall far from the tree. Defendant Sean Combs, who has also been accused of several acts of sexual assault, rape, sexual violence, and drugging, among other deplorable conduct, is the father of Defendant C. Combs, who has seemingly taken after his father and the family business of reckless partying, drugging others, sexual violence, and other illegal conduct. That I mean, you usually don't see that kind of language in a lawsuit. Very, very personal attacks. Also, allegations at this point. Remember, Combs has not been criminally charged. He's not been found liable. These are allegations. But 
when they mention Christian, I, I have to highlight this too. They actually embed into the complaint, not a photo of him on the red carpet, not a photo of him on an album cover, not a photo of him taken by the media. They embed a photo of him and his brother being detained in handcuffs by federal agents during that raid. That is very intentional. Of all the photos to use, you are accusing him of sexual assault and you use that photo? That was no mistake. Now, I am reminded by the fact that Miss O'Markey is being represented by not only Rodney Diggs, but as I mentioned, Tyrone Blackburn. Mr. Blackburn is representing former Diddy producer Rodney Jones, who also filed a separate lawsuit against Diddy, his son Justin, and several others. He claims that he was a victim of sex trafficking and that he was assaulted and subjected to violence. So maybe it is not surprising we are seeing this language as he is representing multiple people accusing the Combs family of illegal conduct. We're going to get back into the merits of these lawsuits in a minute. But going back to the Omarki complaint, Another interesting tidbit is that in addition to Diddy and Christian, there are several unnamed John Doe's and companies who are named as defendants as well. Omarki claims that these people and companies aided and abetted in the commission of the conduct described in the lawsuit, and that as the case proceeds, she may add their names later on. Now, Omarki goes into some detail about what this environment on the yacht was like. She talked about how she worked the late night shift from 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. Quote, during the second week of the charter service, there was a significant amount of partying and drug use, which caused the guests to stay up throughout the night. The makeup of the yacht quickly evolved from just defendant S. Combs and his family to include a constant rotation of suspected sex workers and other A-list celebrities such as French Montana and actor Cuba Gooding Jr., Defendant S. Combs turned what was sold as a wholesome family excursion into a hedonistic environment. According to plaintiff, it resulted in an unexpected increase in workload for her and her colleagues, as well as unwanted exposure to unlawful drug use, sex work, and general chaos. She also claims that drinks were spiked by Combs and that women were taken advantage of on the yacht. And she argues that as a bartender, she understands the impact of alcohol. And she, quote, found it very suspicious that after one shot of De Leon tequila or one mixed drink, various women on the yacht would be falling over themselves, panicking or passing out. This led plaintiff, Grace O'Markey, to reasonably believe that the alcohol given to these women was likely laced with drugs. And she even describes one specific event in particular, quote, According to plaintiff, in another incident, defendant S. Combs had several women whom plaintiff suspected of being sex workers on the yacht. In one incident, a girl was extremely upset and ran to the lower deck, locked herself in the massage room, and was hysterically crying. She said she did not feel safe and wanted to leave. The crew was alerted of this. At this time, Sarah Chapman, one of S. Combs's children's mother was due to have a massage, so plaintiff had to attempt to remove this young woman from the massage room, but she was very reluctant as she felt unsafe. Eventually, she left. All of this is important for Omarki's legal claims, namely that Sean Combs is liable for what his son Christian allegedly did to her. Why? Under the premises liability cause of action, and that, by the way, is where a property owner or someone who is in control of a property has a duty to use reasonable care to keep visitors of the property safe. According to Omarki, since Sean Combs leased, occupied, and or controlled the yacht and allowed who was on it and what was happening, this is his fault that she was sexually assaulted by his son. Quote, defendant S. Combs allowed and encouraged the people aboard his yacht, including his son C. Combs, to engage in the drugs and reckless behavior while aboard the yacht. Defendant S. Combs' negligence was a substantial factor in causing plaintiff's harm because of failing to properly use and secure the yacht and for fostering an environment for drug use and assault to occur without ramifications. So in the law, you need to show causation for this. But for what Combs did, this would not have occurred. We really have to show that you created a condition where it was foreseeable this would happen, that Combs knew or should have known this assault would happen because of the environment he created. You might be saying, okay, that seems like a strong claim. Maybe it doesn't. But then you have the aiding and abetting claim against Sean Combs too. Quote, 
Defendant S. Combs knew that an assault, battery, sexual assault was being committed and was and going to be committed against plaintiff because he encouraged and fostered an environment and culture to his son and his employees to do whatever they want with plaintiff and the other yacht staff. And O'Markey goes on to describe how Combs covered up the assault too, that he paid off the yacht captain to keep quiet, allegedly gave him a big tip. By the way, talking about that captain, O'Markey says that after she told the yacht captain, Pitar Milkov, about what happened to her, he, quote, berated her, lacked compassion or concern, failed to investigate, and insisted that she was probably voluntarily partying with the guest. She was not. She also says that, quote, Captain Milkov added insult to injury by assigning plaintiff to work in front of the house, which required personally serving defendant C. Combs while they were on the yacht. Now, imagine for a moment that she really is a victim of Christian Combs. That is really sinister stuff. But now let's go back to when Christian Combs allegedly drugged and assaulted Omarki. Remember, these are allegations at this point. I, and I explained a little bit of the background about this in our previous sidebar, but one interesting detail from the complaint that we didn't bring up is that according to Omarki, when an allegedly heavily intoxicated Christian Combs came aboard the yacht on that night and went into the recording studio and started ordering tequila shots, Omarki claims that Cassandra Ventura, or Cassie's Me and You, that song, was playing in the background. What makes that, as Omarki says in the lawsuit, ironic, is that Cassie was a former artist and girlfriend of Sean Combs who filed that initial lawsuit against him back in 2023, claiming that she was physically and sexually abused by the rapper and producer. She ended up settling with him, but remember, that was the first lawsuit that began all of this. From there, we saw more lawsuits against Combs. We saw the raids. Now, that is a very specific detail for Omarki to remember that arguably adds to her narrative, right? And kinds of adds a weird context to it. But I imagine that if she were to testify at trial about hearing this song, again, so specific, that would be challenged by Combs's lawyers. And they would say, you remember that? Is that awfully convenient? You remember that detail? Maybe you don't remember other things. So I guess uh, that could be something that she would, uh, or something that that would be challenged. Okay, but now going back to this event. Omarki claims that initially she was forced to take tequila shots, that she wasn't allowed to leave. She claims that her drink was spiked, and she said that she was very scared and in a very dangerous situation with Christian Combs. Now, I'm not sure if this is a typo, but in the actual suit, it says that Sean Combs touched her legs, her breasts, her private areas and started kissing her on her neck, face, and hands. I'm pretty sure that's a typo uh, because it seems like she has been alleging that it was Christian who sexually assaulted her. She doesn't sue Sean Combs for assault or battery. So, again, I think this is a typo. And if it is, that doesn't look good. This is arguably one of the most important lines in this lawsuit. You mess up who you're talking about? But, I, I mean, I don't know what to make of it. But here is what we do have. Omarki claims that Rodney Jones, as I mentioned, Diddy's former producer, now plaintiff, suing Combs for sexual assault in a separate lawsuit, that he was there on the yacht that night and actually recorded the audio of this assault, all this whole episode happening. She provides a transcript of what she says is Christian Combs drugging and sexually assaulting her. I'm going to read it for you now. Christian, yo, it's shot o'clock. Grace, no, I'm not doing shots, Christian. Christian, everybody, we got to take a shot. In a second audio tape, Grace says, I'll just put the ledge. Christian, no, 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 take the whole thing. Grace, no, you will take it as well. Christian, take the whole shot. Grace, I'm only doing it as long as you take it as well. Christian, I ain't going to lie. I'm not taking nothing. Please, please take the shot. Grace, you are drugging me? Christian, take the shot. Hey, yo, play another beat one time because now and then there is a transcript of Christian's alleged sexual assault of Grace. Cassie's me and you playing in the background, allegedly. Grace, this is not an offer. Christian, you said what? Grace, I can't. I'm swapping out. I can't do it. I'm sorry, darling. Christian, nah, we need you. Grace, I'm going to stop. Stop. I have to go. I have to go. Honestly, I'm like already losing sleep. I have to go now. Christian. You're the best one on this ship, though. Grace, what do you mean? Christian, who's going to replace you? Grace, who's going to replace me? 
Christian, F that. That's going to be trash, though. You feel me? Grace, excuse me. You don't touch my legs like that. I'll move my legs where I want to. If I want to do this, then I will. You don't touch my legs like that. Christian, listen, you and everybody in the crew, it's great. Grace, I can't. I have to go down. I have to go down. Christian, no, you tell me. Listen, Grace, what? Christian, like say, Christian, like say you're just vibing with me the whole time. Grace, I can't. I promise you. I wish I could, but I can't. Unless I say that you guys requested me. Christian, yes, who can I talk to right now? Who can I talk to? I'm going to say I requested you right now. Grace, well, you can take your hand off my ass for the first thing. Now, according to Grace in her complaint, or Ms. Markey in her complaint, she basically says she was saying that he needed to get permission, um, and all the people that would give her him permission to hang out with her were asleep, so this was kind of a ruse for her to escape. So Omarki explains in the complaint that she loved yachting, even at an early age, that she traveled the world, that she enjoyed a successful career where she received high praise, great feedback, great reviews, but, quote, prior to being sexually assaulted by defending Christian Combs, Plaintiff planned to work the entirety of her career in hospitality and the yachting industry. Unfortunately, those plans have been derailed due to the trauma plaintiff continues to have as a result of the assault. And let's talk about what Amarki claims here. She claims that 2023 was the most deeply traumatizing time of her life. She talks about how after the alleged assault and cover-up, she was isolated, she was retaliated against, and she was ultimately fired. She even lost her longtime partner. She says that her mental health significantly deteriorated to the point where she required medication and therapy and she fell into a deep depression. She claims that she couldn't even perform her maid of honor duties for her sister. She also claims that she developed a severe eating disorder, suffered from suicidal ideations, and even had seizures. So if she can prove that in a trial, that is going to be not only devastating testimony for Christian Combs and Sean Combs, but really important in terms of damages calculations. So she ends up suing Christian Combs for assault, battery, sexual assault, intentional and negligent infliction of emotional distress, and as I mentioned earlier, the other claims against Sean Combs as well. Now, I do want to call out something else from the lawsuit, some other mentions in the lawsuit. You remember Brendan Paul, who we talked a lot about here on Sidebar? He was listed in Rodney Jones's lawsuit as Diddy's alleged drug mule that supplied Diddy with narcotics and weapons. He was actually arrested on the day of the raids for drug possession at a Miami airport. Well, he is listed in this Grace O'Markey lawsuit too. Quote, according to plaintiff, defendant S. Combs' assistant and noted drug mule, Brendan Paul, once came down to the pantry and was laughing uncontrollably. He told plaintiff that he had to sit and watch defendant S. Combs have sex with multiple women. He said defendant S. Combs wanted him present just in case he needed him to get him something while he was in the middle of the act. Plaintiff questioned why Brendan would want to work for defendant S. Combs if he was required to do such things, and Brendan replied that defendant S. Combs was a good link to have in the industry. There's also an interesting section that mentions how A-list guests came on board the yacht. That includes a Philadelphia rapper, a 30-year-old Atlanta rapper who rose to prominence following the release of his 2017 mixtapes, a 25-year-old British rapper, a Moroccan rapper signed to Bad Boy Records and Maybach Music Group, and a former model and CEO of a female urban clothing brand. I'm not going to guess who these people are. If anybody online wants to do their due diligence, feel free to do it. Now, I will tell you who is actually mentioned, who is named in this lawsuit, Cuba Gooding Jr. He is not a defendant in this case, but he is mentioned. And we remember that Jones actually filed a lawsuit against Cuba Gooding Jr. He says that he was sexually assaulted by the actor on Diddy's yacht, by the way, actually accused Sean Combs of facilitating this abuse. But in this lawsuit, Omarki claims that Cuba Gooding Jr. was extremely unpleasant to serve, that he sat at the bar, made derogatory comments to her, that he was visibly intoxicated, and she was in the room and witnessed him inappropriately touching Rodney Jones. So she will be an important witness in Jones's lawsuit, and vice versa. Jones and Omarki are linked in a way, right? They both are there to testify to prove the claims of the other. So quite the lawsuit, to say the least. But 
I got to give you some updates. Omarkey's attorney, Tyrone Blackburn, he told NBC News, quote, it gives us no joy or pleasure in filing this suit against Christian Combs, who has clearly adopted his father's pattern and practice of depravity. While her other attorney, Rodney S. Diggs, also told NBC, quote, I am here to fight for those who can't fight for themselves, and I applaud Grace for being so brave to come forward with her truth. However, Aaron Dyer, an attorney for Christian and Diddy, said in a statement that the lawsuit from Grace O'Markey was, quote, another lewd and meritless claim from Tyrone Blackburn. Quote, this complaint is filled with the same kind of manufactured lies and irrelevant facts we've come to expect from Blackburn. We will be filing a motion to dismiss this outrageous claim. Now, a motion to dismiss is when you say the plaintiff has not stated an actual claim. The door, like the court doesn't have jurisdiction or there's some other problem with the actual pleadings. That's how you get rid of it at the outset. Now, I had mentioned in a previous sidebar about how Mr. Blackburn was not only criticized by opposing counsel, but even a federal judge in New York who referred to him to the grievance committee for allegedly filing lawsuits that have deficiencies that he improperly files cases in federal court to garner media attention and to embarrass defendants with salacious details. So keeping that criticism in mind for a moment, where we're talking about are these claims, are these allegations in these lawsuits credible? Just now, Instagram model Jade Ramey, who Rodney Jones claimed in his lawsuit was one of the people that Diddy allegedly bragged about paying to be a sex worker, She has fired back against these allegations from Rodney Jones. Through her publicist, through her publicist, Ramey told Entertainment Tonight in a statement, quote, dating someone doesn't directly correlate to any of the false allegations made. Yes, I dated someone. How unfortunate we've entered a time where caring for someone or falling in love is worthy of scrutiny in the court of public opinion. What may be amusing for you is real life for others, and my feelings have never been for entertainment nor are they up for discussion. We need to be more conscious as a society when ridiculing people's lives and relationships merely for enjoyment. I appreciate everyone's kind messages and support during this time. Thank you. Also, Sean Diddy Combs' ex-girlfriend, Young Miami, who Jones also listed as one of the people that Diddy claimed was a sex worker, denied the allegations too. Writing on Instagram, I'm not a prostitute. I never sold... And she has an emoji for, you can do the math, an emoji for her private parts. I never sold a day in my life. I hate how this is getting spun. And again, what do we make of these allegations? Serious allegations, but allegations nonetheless. And what about Diddy? In the aftermath of the lawsuits, in the aftermath of the raids, there are these videos and pictures of him that have surfaced in Miami, out, relaxing, holding up the peace sign. But he also just posted on Instagram the music video for his 1997 song, Victory, where he runs from police. And he wrote in the caption, bad boy for life, followed by a raised fist emoji. There are these existing civil lawsuits that have been filed against Combs and people in his inner circle. There's amended complaints of existing lawsuits that add new defendants. And that's what we want to talk about. We have Rodney Jones, music producer, known as Little Rod Jones, filed a sworn declaration with the court just this week, going into more detail about what he saw and heard Combs allegedly do during the year or so they were working together on the Love album. We actually went more in depth on that new document in another episode of Sidebar. But what we want to talk about right now is that some of the people mentioned in these filings, they have responded with statements of their own or representatives of them have released statements on their behalf, while there's others who have been silent. So, for example, there's actor Cuba Gooding Jr., who settled his own sexual abuse lawsuit last year before it could go to trial. He also pled guilty to a lesser charge of harassment for forcibly kissing a nightclub worker, avoiding jail time. But according to Jones' complaint, the actor allegedly touched and groped him inappropriately aboard Combs' yacht even accuses Combs of facilitating this alleged abuse to happen. But the actor seems to be keeping a low profile, has not responded to the allegations as far as we can see. Others, however, are speaking out and they are defending their innocence. Let's start it off with, you know who best, Combs. So Combs himself has spoken out multiple times through his lawyers in reaction to both the lawsuits and the raids on his homes. 
We start in late 2023 when Combs' ex-girlfriend and Bad Boy Entertainment artist Cassie filed a reported $30 million lawsuit accusing Combs of assault, abuse, trafficking, and a lot more. But the very next day, Combs settled the lawsuit. But I should tell you that settling does not mean that Combs admitted anything. His attorney at the time, Ben Braffman, released a statement saying, quote, Mr. Combs' decision to settle the lawsuit does not in any way undermine his flat-out denial of the claims. He is happy they got to a mutual settlement and wishes Miss Ventura the best. Combs himself released his own short statement saying, quote, We have decided to resolve this matter amicably. I wish Cassie and her family all the best. Love. But we know that Combs was then hit with more lawsuits after Ventura's. A woman named Joy Dickerson Neal claimed that Combs drugged and sexually assaulted her when she was in college back in 1991. She alleged that Combs filmed the rape, shared the video with others as a form of revenge porn. Did he deny the allegations? In fact, in a statement from his spokesperson that was released to people at the time, it said, quote, this last minute lawsuit is an example of how a well-intentioned law can be turned on its head. By the way, that was referring to a law in New York at the time that gave people a one-year look-back window to sue for older claims of sexual abuse. But the statement goes on to say, quote, Ms. Dickerson's 32-year-old story is made up and not credible. Mr. Combs never assaulted her, and she implicates companies that did not exist. This is purely a money grab and nothing more. Then there was another lawsuit filed from an unidentified woman who claimed that Combs and singer-songwriter Aaron Hall raped her 30 years ago. Diddy once again in a statement through his spokesperson to People said, quote, these are fabricated claims falsely alleging misconduct from over 30 years ago and filed at the last minute. This is nothing but a money grab. Because of Mr. Combs' fame and success, he is an easy target for anonymous accusers who lie without conscience or consequence for financial benefit. It goes on to state, The New York legislature surely did not intend or expect the Adult Survivors Act to be exploited by scammers. The public should be skeptical and not rush to accept these bogus allegations. Then, Combs again issued a statement on Instagram, this one saying, Enough is enough. For the last couple of weeks, I have sat silently and watched people try to assassinate my character, destroy my reputation, and my legacy. Sickening allegations have been made against me by individuals looking for a quick payday. Let me be absolutely clear. I did not do any of the awful things being alleged. I will fight for my name, my family, and for the truth. And by the way, I, I've spoken about this before on a previous sidebar, that, uh, and this was before the raids, that when you see all of these lawsuits coming out one after the other, you could say, well, people finally felt free and comfortable to go after Sean Combs. That's, we've seen it before. Maybe it has nothing to do with the credibility of what they're saying. Um, but then again, the other way of looking at it is, is something to say that you have one lawsuit after the other, after the other, after he settled with Cassie Ventura. Some would look at that as suspicious. I'm sure that's something that will be honed in upon by his defense team. And if this does go to trial, of course, it will be up for a jury or a judge to decide who's telling the truth. But let me actually talk to you now about the response to the Rodney Jones lawsuit, which I mentioned earlier. So Combs attorney, Sean Holly called the claims lies and said, quote, his reckless name dropping about events that are pure fiction and simply did not happen is nothing more than a transparent attempt to garner headlines. We have overwhelming, indisputable proof that his claims are complete lies. Now, in the days after the federal raids on Combs homes on March 25th, his other attorney, Aaron Dyer, released a very lengthy statement on his behalf. It said, quote, there was a gross overuse of military-level force as search warrants were executed at Mr. Combs' residences. There is no excuse for the excessive show of force and hostility exhibited by authorities or the way his children and employees were treated. Mr. Combs was never detained but spoke to and cooperated with authorities. Despite media speculation, neither Mr. Combs nor any of his family members have been arrested, nor has their ability to travel been restricted in any way. This unprecedented ambush, paired with an advanced, coordinated media presence— leads to a premature rush to judgment of Mr. Combs. It was nothing more than a witch hunt based on meritless accusations made in civil lawsuits. There has been no finding of criminal or civil liability with any of these allegations. Mr. Combs is innocent and will continue to fight every single day to clear his name. And we do want to point out, 
What Dyer says in this statement is absolutely true. Neither Combs nor anyone from his family has been arrested, has been charged, and neither a court nor a jury has found him liable in the civil sense with respect to any of these lawsuits yet. However, we did cover a number of sidebars with experts, and I said this as well, that that military-level use of force could be understandable because there were allegations of unregistered firearms, shootings. These are big properties. You don't know what you're entering into. So as much as they are criticizing the raids, there could be an understanding of why that level of force was used. And talking about statements from Diddy or maybe non-statements, since the raids, there are pictures and videos of Diddy around Miami that have surfaced out and about, smiling, riding his bike, sitting in the sun. Not sure if that's a response or not, but What was curious is that he recently posted on Instagram the music video for his 1997 song, Victory, where he's running from police with the caption, Bad Boy for Life, referencing his hit song from 2001. Now, moving on, there is at least one person in Combs' inner circle who is locked up, his alleged drug mule, Brendan Paul. Paul was arrested on the same day as the raids at an airport in Miami for drug possession. He bonded out and has another hearing scheduled for April 24th. But you'll remember that Paul was mentioned by name several times in Jones' civil lawsuit. He says that Paul was in charge of procuring drugs for Combs and would often pack his carry-on luggage full of marijuana, cocaine, ecstasy, and more, allegedly so that Combs would have access to it at all times, no matter where he was. Paul, though, did not speak to police on the body cam video, and we reviewed that from his arrest. And He has made no public statement since then. We haven't seen it. But as Diddy seems to continue to live his life as normally as possible, his sons seem to be doing the same. Christian King Combs and Justin Dior Combs. They were both mentioned in Rodney Jones' lawsuit, with Justin actually being named as a defendant. Both men, by the way, were detained outside of Combs' house while agents got a handle on who might be at the property. They weren't arrested. They were just detained. But after the mention of Christian Combs in the lawsuit and the raids on the L.A. and Miami homes, Christian continued to post on Instagram seemingly regularly, including a post on his Instagram story that just said, quote, stop with the, and it's the blue cap emoji, cap is slang for lying. Since that post, however, Jones lawyers have filed a separate lawsuit on behalf of the woman allegedly assaulted by Christian Combs on a yacht in 2022, which was mentioned in the music producer's complaint. Grace O'Markey's lawsuit goes into much more detail about what she says happened to her while she was working as a steward. She claims that Christian forced her to take shots of liquor, which she believes were laced with drugs, and says that he touched her all over her body without permission, that she also claims that he tried to force her to perform oral sex on him, that she had to fight him back. And since those allegations came out, Christian has not yet addressed them publicly, however, but his lawyer has, Aaron Dyer. Again, he's representing Sean Combs, too. So there was this statement that was released that called out Jones and O'Markey's lawyer, Tyrone Blackburn. It said, quote, this is just another lewd and meritless claim from Tyrone Blackburn, just like what he filed in the Rodney Jones lawsuit, which he still has not served. The complaint is filled with the same kind of manufactured lies and irrelevant facts we've come to expect from Blackburn. This is exactly why the federal judge in New York slapped him two days ago for a pattern of behavior in improperly filing cases of federal court to garner media attention embarrassed defendants with salacious allegations and pressure defendants to settle quickly and why he was referred to the disciplinary committee in the Southern District of New York. We will be filing a motion to dismiss this outrageous claim. And of course, we talked about that in a previous sidebar, all these issues surrounding Blackburn. He was referred to the grievance committee. But one of the people that is publicly defending Sean Combs, and I will tell you, we don't really see it, is Stevie J. This is an award-winning producer, music producer, who has been friends with Combs for decades. And he was actually recently seen in Miami riding on a golf cart with Combs. In fact, Stevie J says that he was inside the Miami house when Homeland Security agents raided it back in March. In an interview with Fox 5 New York, Stevie J said, quote, My man would never break the law. We're law-abiding citizens. That's what we do. You know this is another crucifixion of a black man. 
But Stevie J was mentioned in Rodney Jones' lawsuit in connection with allegations of grooming. Yes, Jones says that he is a heterosexual male, but claims that Combs kept trying to coerce him into having sex with the men. Combs allegedly showed Jones a video of two men having sex and claimed that one of the men was Stevie J, a person that fellow music producer Jones looked up to and admired. Jones claims that Combs was using this video to try to groom Jones, and it was never confirmed that the video actually showed Stevie J, who dismissed the allegations by saying that Jones and his attorneys are just trying to make money. But Stevie J also shared a video on Instagram with the caption, this is what a real Diddy party looks like. The pre-produced video features several celebrities, including Dr. Dre, Jay-Z, Kobe Bryant, the Kardashians, like they're arriving on a red carpet event. But now let's talk about somebody else. Lucian Grange, the CEO of Universal Music Group. So he and UMG are named as defendants in the Rodney Jones lawsuit. They are accused of aiding and abetting Sean Combs' purported sex trafficking and abuse. But attorneys for UMG and Grange have called the claims, quote, offensively false. And they say that Tyrone Blackburn knowingly filed false allegations without the slightest factual or legal basis. In fact, one of the lawyers, Donald Zakarin, wrote, a license to practice law is a privilege. Mr. Blackburn, plaintiff's lawyer, has misused that license to self-promote gratuitously, falsely, and recklessly accusing the UMG defendants of criminal behavior. Now, Justin Combs is also named as a defendant in Jones' lawsuit. Accuses him of sex trafficking and possibly participating in a shooting at a recording studio. So a representative for Justin Combs responded, told CNN in a statement, quote, Justin Combs categorically denies these absurd allegations. They are all lies. This is a clear example of a desperate person taking desperate measures in hopes of a payday. There will be legal consequences for all defamatory statements made about the Combs family. As far as we could tell, though, nothing from Justin Combs directly, publicly responding to these allegations. There is someone who did, though, because some of the people referenced in these lawsuits are not actually identified. Instead, the name is redacted, and it's almost as if the filing is giving clues to who these people may be. So, for example... Jones' lawsuit says Combs had a sexual relationship with a rapper from Philadelphia who dated Nicki Minaj and that this rapper consorted with underage girls and sex workers. Well, turns out that online sleuths have narrowed that down to Meek Mill, who promptly went on a rant on X, formerly known as Twitter, about how he is not a homosexual. Most of those tweets have been deleted now, but a post from April 8th before Jones filed his amended complaint, Meek says that he wants all the evidence to come out and swears he's not a part of the freak or coke part of the industry. He says he's not a heathen and wants to know how his name even got brought up in the first place. And keeping with that idea of people who are mentioned in the suit but not named as defendants, let's talk about Daphne Joy. She is the ex of rapper 50 Cent, who's been quite vocal and critical. Of Diddy after these raids, they've had an ongoing feud for years, but Joy was named in the Jones lawsuit as someone who was one of the participants in Diddy's sex trafficking and freak off sex sessions and that she would receive money for sex. Well, Joy responded to the allegations in an Instagram post writing, quote, I am deeply hurt by the lies in Rodney Jones lawsuit. The claim that I am a sex worker is 100% false and character assassination. I am retaining an attorney to explore all legal remedies against both Rodney and his attorney. So another person threatening legal action. But she's not the only one. No, Combs' ex-girlfriend, Young Miami, who Jones listed as one of the people that Combs claimed was also a sex worker, denied the allegations too. Writing on Instagram, I'm not a prostitute. I never sold... There's an emoji to describe or reference a female's private area. I never sold that a day in my life, and I hate how this is getting spun. Then you have Instagram model Jade Ramey, who Jones claimed in his lawsuit was also one of the people that Diddy allegedly bragged about paying to be a sex worker. She's fired back. Through her publicist, Ramey told Entertainment Tonight in a statement, quote, dating someone doesn't directly correlate to any of the false allegations made. Yes, I dated someone. How unfortunate we've entered a time where caring for someone or falling in love is worthy of scrutiny in the court of public opinion. What may be amusing for you is real life for others, 
and my feelings have never been for entertainment, nor are they up for discussion. We need to be more conscious as a society when ridiculing people's lives and relationships merely for enjoyment. I appreciate everyone's kind messages and support during this time. So that is a collection of some of these responses. And look, as these civil cases move forward, I would be very interested to see if any of these people are called as witnesses, what they would say on the stand whether or not it would be favorable to Jones's claims or not, and whether they are going to take legal action in response to this. But as these cases and as the investigation progress, I am sure we will see a lot more reactions. Jonathan Adi. Now, that name may seem familiar to you, and I will explain why. But what I'm also going to do is try to break down and possibly debunk the connection between this man and Combs, but maybe not. Because as wild as some of his claims were, they may make sense now. We'll talk about that. The reason I say all of this is because after several bombshell lawsuits were filed against Combs, accusing him of sexual assault, physical violence, human trafficking, after federal agents raided his homes reportedly pursuant to an ongoing sex trafficking investigation, all of these numerous videos and social media posts and old interviews and more, they've all popped up particularly in the last two weeks, people trying to make some connections between what he said or people said and these allegations. Now, to be clear, Combs has not been charged with any crimes connected to this raid, but his charges may be on the horizon and the investigation continues, there is something that has surfaced. This police interrogation of a man who allegedly opened fire inside of one of former President Donald Trump's hotels, Jonathan Adi. What is his connection to Diddy, or should I say perceived connection to Diddy? Let me give you a little background. Now, you might remember back in 2018, a man went into the Trump National Doral Miami Hotel and Resort in the middle of the night and went on a rampage. The state attorney's office says that Jonathan Adi fired shots inside the lobby and toward the chandelier on the ceiling, then draped a giant American flag across the hotel's front desk. He allegedly walked around breaking items like computer monitors, throwing things around the lobby. When police officers arrived and confronted him, there was a shootout. Adi seemingly tried to make a run for it, but he had been shot in the leg. He didn't get very far. Police found him hiding. They took him into custody. Adi was taken to the hospital with three gunshot wounds, two in one leg, one in the other. And while at the hospital, Adi reportedly made several bizarre statements and asked repeatedly to speak with the FBI, Secret Service, CIA, the media. When Adi appeared before a judge, he didn't make any kind of wild outburst, but he seemingly admitted to committing at least one of the crimes he's charged with. One count of aggravated assault with a firearm, one count of armed burglary with a battery or an assault, one count of armed criminal mischief causing damages greater than $1,000, one count of armed grand theft, and one count of making a false a fire alarm offense. So those are the charges. Sir, do you have any money to pay for your own private attorney? Um, I will request as of now um, uh, that the court grants me an attorney. I do have uh, funds to pay for my attorney, but I haven't had time to meet with him yet. So I don't know if they're going to take my case or not. Given the serious nature of these charges, I will appoint the public defender's office to represent you for this preliminary um, first appearance hearing. Well, it's, it's very clear. It says a surveillance footage and witness accounts corroborate that the defendant discharged a handgun multiple times at the arriving city of Doral Police Department and Miami-Dade Police Department law enforcement officers. So that even though it doesn't specifically state five, it does mention that there were more than, I believe, two, un, two um, uniform officers in addition to the unarmed security guard who threatened to kill as well. And there, there was damages greater than $1,000 at the, at the Trump National Doral because it says it was over 30000 So anything else? Um, well, unclear. Well, like I said, there's unclear. There's not a number specifically listed. There could have been one officer on one side and one officer on the other, and that's officers in general and plural. Um, as far as that's... And I don't think I didn't see necessarily the alarm pushing, but that might that might not be push alarm. <laughs> it's not specifically mentioned here, although. Okay. 
you know, sir, everything's being recorded, just so you know. If you want to speak, it's fine. I'm happy to listen. Your attorney turned the microphone off, though. Probably a wise move. Despite having happened so many years ago, though, Adi's case is still not yet gone to trial. The next in-person status update at the Miami-Dade County Courthouse is scheduled for April 19th. So with all that in mind, what does this all have to do with Diddy? Well, after Adi was released from the hospital while still wearing what appears to be a hospital gown, Adi did interviews with law enforcement, including the Secret Service. And we have part of that interrogation. And I will tell you right now, he says some bizarre stuff, okay? After talking about various kinds of conspiracy theories, Adi asks this one thing out of the blue. Do you know Sean Combs? Puff Daddy? Yeah. P. Diddy, whatever you call himself. Yeah. Says, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, he's part of what's called the boule. The, the boule. The boule is a branch of the Illuminati. Okay. And it's the black people. Okay, first thing to talk about here. The boule is a real thing. It is the senior leadership of Sigma Pi Phi fraternity, the oldest postgraduate fraternity founded by and for black men. It was a secret society in its beginning, but now has chapters all over the United States. This is an organization for black professionals already experienced in their careers. And Sean Diddy Combs is sometimes rumored to have been a member of Sigma Pi Phi, but no indication that he is. Now, a little later in this interview, Adi says he settled a lawsuit with Combs, but doesn't really go into detail. This is when he starts to create a web of people that he believes are involved in a larger conspiracy. Um, I had settlement with Sean, okay? And he belongs to that agenda. That's why he's so famous. They land all the contracts. It's his attorneys, which are Mark Garagos and Ben Mercedes. Ben Mercedes worked for Bad Boy Entertainment for four years and worked for Hillary Rodman for five, okay? So Mark Garagos and Ben Mercedes might be names you recognize. They are well-known legal partners who have represented celebrities like Michael Jackson, Chris Brown, Winona Ryder, Colin Kaepernick, Jesse Smollett. Now, Mark Garagos has helped Combs fight legal battles before. In fact, in 2015, the Los Angeles County District Attorney decided not to file felony charges against Combs after he reportedly assaulted a football coach at UCLA with a kettlebell weight. Now, Combs' son, Justin, was on the team, and the coach reportedly sent him home from practice. It was a whole big mess. Ben Maselis, though, he has an even closer relationship with Combs. He was actually a Bad Boy Entertainment intern back when it was Bad Boy Records. Ben and his father, Kenny, were honored at a Variety magazine event called Power of Law back in 2019, and Combs was there to speak about them. Ben Masalius also took the podium and had some kind words for Combs. He said, quote, Sean Combs gave me an internship which changed my life when I was in high school. For those who don't know, Bad Boy Records is the SEAL Team 6 of internships. It prepared me for everything, being under Puff's tutelage, which is why I think when judges yell at me, it's nothing compared to Puff. He talked about joining up with Mark Garagos after he graduated from Georgetown, saying he believed Garagos truly liked him because, quote, no matter how hard he yelled at me, I was willing to take it based on everything I had experienced with Puffy. Okay, so Adi knows that Garagos and Maselius are connected with Combs, but the agenda that they're supposedly pushing is unclear at this point in the interview. But then Adi drops a bombshell. So. In a 2023 lawsuit, Cassie, whose real name is Cassandra Ventura, she sued Sean Combs. She claimed that the rapper just supplied her with drugs, forced her to participate in group sex with prostitutes. She says that the sessions were often filmed. Okay, this is what she alleged in 2023. That lawsuit was settled. But now listen to what Adi says. Again, before this lawsuit was ever filed, before any of these details that she alleged were made public, listen to what he said. I had sex with Cassie and Sean. Basically, he would, uh, he would masturbate and tell me what to do with Cassie. I had like 15 encounters, and I heard lots of business. Because what they would do is Sean talks a lot on the, on the phone and on the TV with speaking and stuff, and I, would be in the, I was like a sex slave, okay? For them, that's what I was. That's all. All right. That is eerie. That is eerie. But not only that, Adi says he got an STD from the encounter 
and sued. Um, I caught herpes, and I came back, and I sued him for the herpes, and won. But they didn't did Mark Erebus and Ben Mercedes were his attorneys, okay? And Christopher Leon's here was my attorney. They asked me to turn in that, which was the video recording, and I did so. They gave it back to me accidentally, and it's possible, I, I threw everything out, it's possible I can produce a copy. Of course, this was years before Cassie filed her lawsuit against Combs, so the investigators aren't really sure what Adi is talking about, and they move on. But knowing what we know now about the allegations that Cassie made and others made, Adi's statement seems to corroborate some of what she said, right? Remember, Cassie said she would be forced to have sex with escorts or prostitutes. Adi, who describes himself as an investor and entrepreneur, is also reportedly a former stripper and porn actor. Could it be that he was working as an escort in the Miami area when Cassie claims the session happened? But during the interview, Adi often makes references to a cabal of rich people who have agendas. He claims the hip-hop world had its own goal. The hip-hop agenda is an agenda to move drugs all over the United States. They move, you need to involve the DEA. They, they move all the dope, okay, all the dope on private jets, which don't get screened by, by, uh, by customs, by, by the yeah, yeah, yeah. okay. inside the United States, okay, they they move what's called high grade powder MDMA, they move cocaine and they move uh, liquid cocaine in their bottles too, okay. So they put the liquid cocaine in the bottles and they move. I seen the liquid cocaine. I've drank it myself. Having sex with Diddy and Cassie, okay. It's not good. He drinks it all the time. This particular statement brings your attention to multiple allegations in Cassie's lawsuit, as well as a lawsuit that was filed by Rodney Jones, Little Rod Jones, the former music producer for Diddy. They both talk about rampant drug use within Combs' inner circle. Now, Jones's filing says that Combs' chief of staff, Christina Quorum, required all employees to walk around with a fanny pack filled with cocaine, GHB, ecstasy or MDMA, marijuana gummies, and something called Tucci or pink cocaine. It actually doesn't contain any actual cocaine. It's apparently a mixture of ketamine, MDMA, and caffeine. Adi again mentions an alleged lawsuit settlement between himself and Combs, but really doesn't get the chance to elaborate further. I've had a great life. I've settled five, four point one to five million dollars with Diddy. Okay. okay, was he scared that I wasn't exposing? I don't want to talk about Diddy right now. I'm going to talk about you. Help me understand you. By the way, we have found no evidence that Combs paid Adi five million dollars. Just want to be clear about that. But that is what Adi has to say about Combs in his interrogation. But how does this all connect back to a shootout at a hotel? Well, it seems Adi is making the connection between Combs and his lawyers and then presidential candidate Donald Trump. Adi had made many pro-Trump statements and seemed to believe that the attorneys were trying to take him down. So he decided that the American flag draped across the front desk of a hotel would send some sort of message. Now, while some of what Adi had to say seems to correlate with the new investigation into Combs or these new allegations asserted against Combs, we do need to take everything with a very large grain of salt because Adi is not the most reliable narrator. Here's another portion of his interview. They've been promoting a hate agenda against Trump. So people hate him, okay, because they know he is very alpha, okay, very alpha in the sense that he likes money, he likes to make money, and he likes women, and they know they want to fame in certain ways with Stormy, with other people, because they want him out of the government, okay. But it ain't happening because it's too smart for them. You understand what I'm saying? I'm trying to, right? Don is intelligent. He's, we have a similar type of intelligence and overview of things. The only thing is he's not seeing that Hillary is a distant cousin of his and Obama have a different plan for him. Do you understand? No offense with Obama. I love each and every American, but he was part of that 9-11 agenda. He's a CIA agent, an ex-CIA agent. That's why there's so much identity issues with Obama. Who knows his real name? 
they say what, what he, he was born in uh, Indonesia and he's also born in Hawaii. Nobody knows why. Because he's an ex CIA agent. Okay. Basically, Osama bin Laden never existed. It was a creation of the CIA and it was Obama in a cave talking <laughs> and looking like an Arab. And then they bombed the Twin Towers. Okay? So my problem is I'm here to expose each and single one of them to the American public for the crimes committed on September 11th, 2001. Wild stuff, I know, I know. But could there be some truth sprinkled in with all of that conspiracy talk? Could the feds be talking to Adi and finding out what he knows about Combs and his operation? As I said, Adi's still facing charges in Miami with the next scheduled hearing for a couple weeks from now. Interesting to think about. All right, that's all we have for you right now here on Sidebar, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. As always, please subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Jesse Weber. I'll speak to you next time.